You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. We wanted to make sure that we help catalyze a set of you know, products and capabilities that these companies would have uh, and make available to the marketplace uh, that, you know, provided visibility into the software supply chain and connected that visibility to, you know, potential vulnerabilities that exist as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat and 2K Cyberwire's Privacy Surveillance Law and Policy Podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me, as always, is my co-host Ben Yellen from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hey there, Ben. Hello, Dave. On today's show, Ben has the story of the FBI charging a Wisconsin man with the distribution of AI CSAM. I've got the story of Scarlett Johansson at odds with OpenAI. And later in the show, Melissa O oh and Anil John from the Department of Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate, they're talking about how they're working to advance software chain resiliency. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. The IT world used to be simpler. You only had to secure and manage environments that you controlled. Then came new technologies and new ways to work. Now, employees, apps, and networks are everywhere. This means poor visibility, security gaps, and added risk. That's why Cloudflare created the first-ever connectivity cloud. Visit cloudflare.com to protect your business everywhere you do business. All right, Ben, uh, we got some good stuff to cover here today. You want to start things off for us? Sure. So I have a really interesting uh, novel case that came down this week. And the story I'm using is from 404 Media, uh, written by Samantha Cole. That's the outlet uh, that our friend of the pod, Joseph Cox, is at now. Right. I guess our one-way friend of the pod. (laughs) He doesn't know it. but Yeah, he doesn't know he's a friend of the pod, but he is. Uh, Yeah. Great source, of news on any of the topics, basically, that we cover on this podcast. Yeah, 404 so. Media is really kill, killing it over there. Like, you know, just a, sort of an all-star group of the, an, an Avengers team of, It is totally of an Avengers team. <laughs> they assembled, so. And they've teamed up with another outlet called Court Watch, uh, and together they unearth kind of obscure legal filings, which huh. is, whew, that's like uh, some of my favorite sleuthing in the world is trying to dig up obscure legal filings, so. Right. Admire them for doing that. Yeah. Uh, but this is about a Wisconsin man. His name is Stephen Anderag, and he was indicted this week by the FBI. Uh, the allegation states that he used Stable Diffusion, which is a text-to-image generative AI model, to create realistic images of prepubescent minors. So he basically created child pornographic images, or CSAM. Uh, and the charge claims that he distributed these images via interstate commerce, which is why it's a federal crime, and that he shared the images with a real 15-year-old boy. Uh, Not only did he share the images with him, but he described his process for creating the images and sent him uh, several of these images through Instagram direct messages. Uh, It was Instagram that alerted the National Institute for Missing and Exploited Children, or National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, that CSAM was being distributed. Uh, They traced it back to Mr. Anderegg, and he has been arrested and charged. So I don't know if you've used this sort of text-to-image, artificial generative AI. Uh, I've never used it. Oh, I have. Diffusion. Yes. I mean, they're uh, brilliant ways, fun, uh, enjoyable, 
fruitful ways to use it. Right. Uh, but obviously it has this danger that you can create images that violate the law. And that's exactly what happened here. I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, obviously the, the folks who run these systems try to put guardrails on them. So I, I'm guessing that I, I would love to see the prompts that this person used to get around those guardrails, because I suspect he was pretty creative. Me too. I actually read through the indictment, and they did not have the prompts, which is hmm. kind of what I was looking for. It basically said that he was so explicit in his prompts and so specific into what he was looking for that it was very obvious which images he was trying to generate. But yeah, I don't know why it went around their guardrails, and I'm sure um, there's some head-scratching going on at Stable Diffusion's headquarters to figure out how to prevent this type of thing from happening. Mm. Uh, so this is a really interesting case because the way the FBI is charging this is as if it's as if images are being circulated of actual children. Right. Uh, now, there's the crime of sharing these images, uh, which are prurient and, and illegal, with the 15-year-olds. I think we can certainly all understand that. Yeah. Uh, but transmitting these images over the internet is a crime in the sense that the FBI is considering this to be child pornography. And this would be the first case to test that theory or to test that hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of cases that are sort of quasi-artificial intelligence, like deep fakes, for example, and other cases where you have uh, adults, maybe young adults, who are portraying children. And courts have kind of gone uh, in multiple directions on those issues, generally holding that uh, you can still kind of create a market for child pornography by having things like deep fakes and adults posing as children circulating on the internet, and therefore that type of activity should be illegal. And I would guess that that would be an appellate court's justification in this case if they decide that uh, these charges would stand. Right. Um, I think they would say that by generating these images, even though they don't depict real, actual children, you are creating a market for child pornography such that you trigger the CSAM laws. Uh, and I, I think that'll be a really interesting and novel argument. I'm curious to see how it does in court. So let's go down this path to get this horrible, you know, despicable path together. Um, we've talked about this before here. Um, my understanding has always been that the core of the laws against child pornography are there to protect children from abuse. Yes. That is, that is it is the abuse itself that we're trying to uh, prevent. Um, and so by trying to eliminate the market for this sort of thing, that will slow down and hopefully eliminate the people who are doing these horrible things to children. Right. So when you create an image like this and there are no children involved, is that different? And, and do the same laws apply? I think from the FBI's perspective... And the Deputy Attorney General, Lisa Monaco, was quant uh, quoted on this. They don't see the distinction. You know, you can look at it in a meta sense and say that when you're looking at CSAM images, the vast majority of people have never seen that individual person. So it's less about that individual person. Right. Uh, and it's more about the image itself, I guess. I guess you could surmise that a good portion of the people who would receive images created through generative AI might not know that they're looking at images generated through AI. And I don't really know what legal significance that has. So to pull up this quote by the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General, today's announcement sends a clear message using AI to produce sexually explicit depictions of children is illegal, and the Justice Department will not hesitate to hold accountable those who possess produce or distribute AI-generated uh, child sexual abuse material. Uh, and Deputy Attorney General Monaco said, technology may change, but our commitment to protecting children were, uh, will not. The Justice Department will pursue those who produce and distribute child sexual abuse material, no matter how that material was created. Put simply, CSAM generated by AI is still CSAM. That's the theory. I, I hate the fact that I... It, I... I don't want to sound like I'm coming down on the side of the, the horrible people here, right? Right. But that's an untested. Someone's got to do it. That's, it's a, an un, it's that's, an a, that's a lawyer's job, right. Dave. Well, it's but so that's an untested theory so far. So far, yeah, it is an untested theory. So let me ask you this: mm -hmm. 
suppose somebody writes a short story mm -hmm. about their relation, their their sexual relationship with an underaged child. Mm -hmm. Is that illegal? I I don't know whether it would be under this theory. What if the so does a does a short story fall under First Amendment protection? I I, I think it would. I don't think it qualifies as pornography if it's not. It could be, it would have like literary value and it's not, it doesn't, I don't think it carries the same weight as images yeah. uh, or video. So yes, I think a, a story would be different in that context. I think it would probably be legal. I don't see how you could criminalize that under the First Amendment, um, even though of course it would be morally wrong to do so. Sure. So if we if we play out you know this absurd scenario and we go the the spectrum between the written word on one end, totally photorealistic AI generated imagery on the other end, and we travel between those two things, if I created uh, suppose I wrote uh, I don't want to say I suppose someone, someone yeah. <laughs> Ugh, let's be clear it's not you no it just yeah. uh, it gives me the chills to think about it. Um, suppose someone wrote a story and they illustrated it with stick figures. You know, like I'm trying to like yeah, where... Yeah, that's what a point, really interesting question. At what point does it become the imagery that is problematic? I think... See, I think stick figures uh, portraying a story doesn't have the same effect of creating a market for images of actual children because it's so fundamentally distinct. Right. Generative AI is good enough that the images are realistic and it does create the market. It furthers an interest. It will get more people interested in procuring child pornography, which from a policy perspective is very, very bad. And therefore the abuse of children because there is the, the demand for this. Because there is, there is the demand. The okay. theory is that this creates additional demand yeah. uh, because the images are so realistic in a way that I think stick figures would not. Uh -huh. But, you know, I, I love going down the spectrum. What about something like anime? Right, right. Because that's realistic-ish. It's not stick figures, but it's very clear that the images are not good depictions of actual human beings. Right. So I guess it's up to our court system and the Justice Department itself to, to draw that line. I mean, is it, it's the old, who, who was the Supreme Court justice who talked about... Uh, uh, I know it when I see yes. it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it comes I wanna, down I to that, I want to say it was right? Potter Stewart, Justice yeah. Potter Stewart. Yeah. <laughs> right. Someone's going to realize I was wrong on that and send us an angry <laughs> oh, letter. So oh, please gonna, do. You're going to lose your, uh, your your street cred on your Supreme Court, uh, you know, your ability to quote things. Robert Carolina is going to come on and be like, I, <laughs> I don't trust you guys anymore. You got That's that right. quote wrong. Exactly. He's making a list. Yep. <laughs> He's the Santa Claus. He's making a list and checking it twice. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, isn't it... Isn't it uh, who, who, how many times, you know, it is the it is these things at the edges, these these terrible things that we use to define, you know, what the norms are going to be and and what the legal applications are going to be. Yeah, I mean, that's really how our legal system works. Is it's all based on judicial precedent, which is generally really helpful because most cases reflect some facts in previous cases. Right. Then you got a novel case like this, and you have to kind of create new precedent. It's not like there's some written code out there um, that definitively resolves this issue the way it would in, say, a civil law system like you have in most of continental Europe. Yeah. You're reliant on judicial precedent, and this is precedent that, to my knowledge, has just not been created yet. So there are a lot of things that judges can look at. Uh, certainly the Justice Department will be part of these uh, proceedings during the prosecution and uh, will make its case as to why this qualifies as CSAM for the purpose of our uh, anti-CSAM statutes. Uh, I'm sure the defense will be hiring some of the uh, best lawyers in the country to try and argue otherwise. So I'm, I'm very interested in seeing what happens with this case. Uh, this individual is still in custody. Uh, I think he's working out a uh, bond agreement uh, so he'll be released, and then I assume that this case will come to trial. So 
Uh, we have a long way. Uh, he, I guess it's his detention hearing that's scheduled for later this week. Okay. So, unfortunately, we're not going to get a resolution to this case for a long time. But I'm very curious, once we see briefs on um, how this case develops. What about Stable Diffusion, the company who generated this image? It existed on their servers, right? Yeah. Um, what's, what's their argument going to be that they're not liable for this? I think they have a pretty good Section 230 uh, Would it be argument. Section 230? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, because they are just the platform here. It was the individual who was uh, writing the text that led to that prompt. And we want to give Sable Diffusion the ability to curate its content as it sees fit. And that's why, from a policy perspective, we decided to provide them immunity from any decisions they make uh, regarding material to restrict. I think any lawsuit against uh, stable diffusion would probably be barred by Section 230. Interesting. I wonder if, if it'd be in, in their best interest. You know, we, we've heard about these... Um these systems, like you mentioned the um, National Center for Missing and Exploited mm-hmm. Children, you know, they have these automated systems that can look at uh, images, uh, although I suppose they're using, like, they're, so they're using hashes of existing images. Right. And in this case, it's a completely original creation, so it would be hard to detect and in order to report. You know, right. Someone... And also, I mean, what if you what if um what if you accidentally stumbled onto something? You know, you are doing a totally legitimate image generation and the AI hallucinates and you know, your image your your request for, you know, beautiful people bathing on the beach uh at the local uh you know, nude beach who are all over 21 and it acts, and it just hallucinates and puts a bunch of kids in there. It's a scary thought. I think our law already accounts for that because yeah. we criminalize distribution. So presumably somebody would not be distributing it. And we criminalize possession. But generally you have to take some action to establish possession, like saving it on your hard drive or downloading the image. I see. Um, <laughs> so if you're going for delete, 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 delete. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, when right. in doubt, <laughs> report it to the authorities, I would say. Yeah. Uh, at least the authorities within these existing, uh, like you would flag it for the AI company or for Instagram or for whomever. Right. Uh, so that they can go through their process and report it to law enforcement. Yeah. All right. Well, I have to keep an eye on this one. I mean, it it is it's just um it's just disturbing all around and and such an interesting thing to see how it's going to play out. Yeah. Yeah, it is disturbing. Like if you look at the fact pattern of this case, it's scary and and disturbing, but it's going to create a really interesting legal precedent as it develops, and I think that's why it's worth us uh looking into it and, and following this case as it continues. Yeah. All right. Well, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. Again, that's from the folks over at 404 Media, and uh, their work is definitely worth checking out if you haven't already. For sure. Um, My story uh, is a bit lighter. How how could it not be? Yes. (laughs) Hard to get much heavier than our previous story. (laughs) Right, right. Uh, And this has to do with uh, the movie star Scarlett Johansson. Still doesn't return my emails. Uh, <laughs> she was. I'll, I'll ask your wife about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. I thought you were going to ask her about that, like because you're you're good friends with Scarlett Johansson. Now, do you mean her in the Scarlett Johansson sense, or her in the 2012 uh, movie sense, when her the character was portrayed by Scarlett Johansson? Well, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to it, aren't we? <laughs> so, uh, evidently. Scarlett Johansson was approached by the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, to license her voice to be one of the virtual assistants with OpenAI's tools. Um, Now, as you mentioned, uh, Scarlett Johansson famously portrayed an artificial intelligence in the movie Her, which, uh, what would you say, 2012, was that? I think so, yeah, Yeah. starring Joaquin Phoenix. Right, Mm -hmm. right. Uh, so interesting film, um, a, a, a little unnerving, I, th- I thought, the, the, the scenes I've seen from it. But she plays a very convincing AI. Um, and what brings this to 
focus is that OpenAI recently had a press event where they unveiled the most recent version of their AI, which was extremely conversational. People yes. describe it as being flirty. Um, and there's very little latency, very little delay in it responding to you. Can I just say it was a little bizarre? Yeah. Did you watch it? I did. Yeah. Did you not think it was just very weird? The way they were conversing with her and the way she was conversing with them, it was just, I guess not surprising, but just like a little bit a little bit eye-opening. Like It gave me the heebie-jeebies a little bit. That's interesting because you are not the only person who's said that to me. And I would say of the people I've talked to about it, Definitely the majority felt creeped out by it. I did not. Hmm. I did not. And I understand why you would be or could be, but it did not creep me out. I just, for some reason, I just thought, oh, isn't this interesting? This is the next, this is the next phase of, of yeah. where this is going. Yeah, I mean, I think the distinction is how conversational it is. Mm -hmm. Like with our Alexa devices and with Siri, it feels very computerized. Right. We give them the prompt, they think for a second and give us like a very computerized answer. Yeah. The weather today will be 59 right. degrees. <laughs> right. Whereas like this actually felt like you were having a conversation with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So um, evidently, uh, OpenAI had reached out to Scarlett Johansson about using her voice and she had considered it, but ultimately she said no. Um, but then two days before they came out with this demo, they reached out to her again and said, please reconsider. And again, she said no. And then they did this demo and lots of people who watched the demo were like, whoa. That is Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> that yeah. sounds just like Scarlett Johansson. And on top of that, Sam Altman, OpenAI's CEO, posted a one-word tweet on on uh, X Twitter uh, that just was the word her. Big mistake, Altman. <laughs> right? <laughs> Should not have done that. Right. Yep. So, Scarlett Johansson has, uh, has written them a stern letter uh, saying, knock it off. Please don't use my voice. Uh, OpenAI is saying, oh, we weren't using your voice. This was another actress. We can't tell you which actress because uh, because uh, privacy. Uh, <laughs> but it was another actress. Let's just, just say it was, yeah. It was it happened to sound like you, I suppose. I think some people could interpret it that way. But meanwhile, they have uh, stopped the availability, ended the availability of the voice that allegedly sounded like Scarlett Johansson. So uh, it seems to me like there's some tomfoolery going on here Ben, and I'm curious what your take is on this. Can we get to the boring ending of this first so yes. we can get to the actual in, uh, interesting portions of the nitty-gritty? Okay. The boring ending is that there isn't much legal recourse for Scarlett Johansson here. Well, uh, yes, that's part of what I wanted to discuss here. Yeah. So there's an article um, I think that you're using for the segment where they talked to a bunch of legal experts and looked at various statutes, and you really don't have a developed copyright law as it relates solely to people's voices. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really a gap in our laws because voices are very distinctive. Some voices, like mine, uh, it doesn't really matter because the vast majority of people who would hear my voice have no idea who I am and it's not a uh, defining feature. It's not something that's deeply personal to me. Right. Uh, but like Scarlett Johansson is so defined by her voice. She's done voice acting. I mean, she yeah. played this prominent role in that movie. Uh, so it is sort of bizarre that the law hasn't caught up with that. Uh, we have a patchwork of state laws, even in California, which you'd think would have a developed body of law on this, considering it's <laughs> right. the uh, hub of the entertainment industry doesn't really have a relevant statute on this. So she's kind of out of good legal options, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I think she's kind of taking this public. Uh, she released this statement on X that described exactly as you did what, what happened here and um, how she went through this process of nicely rejecting them a couple of times and they went ahead with a voice that sounds uh, eerily similar to hers. So I think it's public shaming. I mean, she is a very well-liked celebrity. Right. Uh, so I think uh, the public shaming kind of worked in this case, got them to shut down 
the system until they can replace it with a voice that doesn't sound so much like Scarlett Johansson. Yeah. I'm thinking more of like a John Krasinski, real casual hangout, but less like the sort of deep AI that you could fall in love with in uh, in her. <laughs> Although I guess I'm sure a lot of people might fall in love with the John Krasinski voice too, but that's who I'm picturing as as the next voice of my conversational uh, AI buddy. Yeah. It's, I was thinking, when I was reading this story, I was thinking about um, impressionists. You know, in the old days, I mean, Rich Little was probably one of the most famous impressionists. Very unfunny, um, but a very good impressionist. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. When you, it is funny how when you look back on his act, he really wasn't that funny. No, but he, wasn't he just good was good at impersonating people. But then, like, I think today, someone like Frank Caliente... Caliendo. Caliendo, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, very well known and an amazing mimic. Yep. Um, a little funnier. Still wouldn't wouldn't put him in my top ten comedians. Yeah. But yep. And then but I think also you see it on Saturday Night Live regularly. Including by Scarlett Johansson, who did a great uh, impersonation of the State of the Union response. Ooh, from, isn't that now? Isn't that interesting? Of uh, Senator Katie <laughs> Britt of, of yes. Alabama. Yes, she did. Yep. So, I mean, I think for comedians, you could say that that falls under fair use for parody and that sort of thing. But if OpenAI just stood by their guns and said, no, it's not, I mean, I, you know, it's not you. It's, I don't know what you're talking about. I suppose someone could think that it kind of sounds like you. But it's like, yeah, a lot of voices sound the same and we based right. it on somebody else. I'm sure they could probably identify that person if they needed to if they're being truthful and say, listen to this person, that's who we modeled it after. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I think there just isn't much of a legal case here. Uh, and that's why she took it public, because there isn't much that uh, she could do to compel them to take the system down. Do you think this could be part of copyright reform? Uh, a better protection for this sort of thing? Yeah, I could see it being wrapped up in like a larger policy package relating to voice impersonation. Mm -hmm. In a way, this is like a bizarre corollary to the case we uh, talked about here in the Baltimore area where there's the deep fake made of the principal saying racist, anti-Semitic things. Right. Uh, that was a voice appropriation case, obviously very different. OpenAI never purported that Scarlett Johansson was hanging out with you while you talked to your new chatty AI assistant. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the similarity is that we have this gap in our current laws that deals with mimicking people's voices. Mm -hmm. I think things like fair use certainly still apply, which is why parody would be protected. But I think um, something like this, where it is, I, I mean, Scarlett Johansson derives value from her voice. It is just the way the New York Times derives monetary value from its journalism. It's it's an asset that they have. It's an asset that she has. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting when you look at some of the guardrails that um, some of these large language models have put on themselves. For example, um, if I ask it to pretend like you're uh, Martin Short and write five insults about, you know, my good friend Ben Yellen. Mm -hmm. It will come back and say, I'm sorry, I cannot pretend to be a celebrity or a known person. I say, okay, write me five jokes in the style of Martin Short that are about my good friend Ben Yellen. Then it will it'll do it. That's the first thing I'm going to do after we're done recording. <laughs> I'm interested to see how, uh, how he would roast me. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But my point being that if if I if I said to my assistant, um, I would like your voice to be in the style of Tom Hanks or James Earl Jones or Scarlett Johansson or I what why wouldn't it do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think feel like it's or Cookie Monster, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that should be the same thing. I mean, I, th I do think it is a form of intellectual property hmm. because these voices are distinctive and they carry their own value. So you're kind of co-opting Tom Hanks's voice or Cookie Monster's voice mm -hmm. without paying them for a service that they're really providing. I mean, that's the purpose of copyright right law. 
correct? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, you'd get these very tough cases where you'd have to go in deep into discovery to figure out, well, was it actually based on Scarlett Johansson? Right. Uh, you'd have to look through OpenAI's email records and subpoena, you know, everything that they've said to one another in the past three years to see if their story holds up. Right. And I have a feeling that nobody would want to go through that litigation. So it would be good for Congress or even state legislatures, particularly like California, which has the capacity to do something like this, to really lay out the rights people have in uh, the appropriation of their voice. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, we will have a link to that story in the show notes. And of course, we would love to hear from you. If there's something you'd like us to consider for the show, you can email us. It's caveat at n2k.com. And now a word from our sponsor, Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. Cyber attackers are using AI in creative ways to compromise users and breach organizations. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Zscaler has extended its zero-trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion daily signals. Learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust plus AI to prevent ransomware and AI attacks. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. Ben, I recently spoke with Melissa O oh and Anil John. They are both from the Department of Homeland Security's Science and Technology Directorate. And we're discussing uh, some of the work that they and their colleagues are doing to help advance software supply chain resiliency. Here's my conversation with Melissa O oh and Anil John. As part of the um, Department of Homeland Security and the Silicon Valley Innovation Program, for context, um, since we work with the startup community a lot and uh, identify areas of um, partnership with the startups and DHS, when coordinating with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, uh, within DHS, there was a significant amount of um, energy and recognition that the software supply chain uh, is an area that we need to put a lot of focus on. And uh, CISA approached us, uh, SVIP, to find ways to improve the adoption and and ways to encourage um, more use of the software bills of material that they are championing. And so as part of SVIP, we decided that that was an important area for us to, to work with them on. We conducted an ideation workshop to identify what some of those areas of concern were. And, uh, and so that's why, um, in partnership with CISA, we, uh, we put out the call to work with startups um, in this area. Anil, you might actually offer some additional uh, flavor to that. Um, uh, so feel free to do that. Absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. And I think the only piece that I would add would be that it was important that in the solicitation, we targeted the development of capabilities that actually served multiple communities. Um, a software developer, um, you know, sitting in front of their IDE, um, uh, gaining visibility into uh, what are the components uh, of software uh, that they're integrating into their uh, into their build. Uh, a system administrator who has a responsibility to understand you know, what capabilities might, uh, what components of software, what SDKs, uh, what other pieces of software might exist within the platforms and technologies that they're managing. And obviously at the enterprise level, having a broad uh, visibility into the software assets that exist as well. All of those things were important uh, to both us and to CESA. And those are some of the things that uh, ended up being uh, reflected in the solicitation that went out. And so where do we stand right now? How much progress has been made? Melissa? Yeah, um, so our uh, our startups um, are uh, making a lot of great progress. They finished phase one. Part of that phase one, they transitioned 
Protobomb, which is the uh, software translation tool to uh, Open SSF, the Open Security Software Security uh, Foundation, and uh, um, that's exciting for us. And uh, as as far as where they're at now, they're actually entering. Uh, many of them have started their phase two, and that the cohort of companies, as as Anil mentioned, they're building out those commercial capabilities to provide those software visibility tools with Protobomb baked in and with the capability to to provide those services and solutions to uh, end users, but also encourage uh, and ensure that the open source aspect of this solution uh, is continued to be maintained uh, and used uh, and adopted. And I think that's an important you know, a part of the way that we structured the solicitation itself and how the companies that we selected are working uh, in general. Uh, because we wanted to make sure that we helped catalyze a set of you know, products and capabilities that these companies would have uh, and make available to the marketplace uh, that you know, provided visibility into the software supply chain and connected that visibility to you know, potential vulnerabilities that exist as well. But we also wanted to make sure that beyond just the products and the capabilities that these companies were working on, we also did something that benefited the broader software development and the software security ecosystem uh, as well. And that's where the other part of our solicitation was we required the companies that were working on all of these products to work together as a cohort in order to develop what uh, Melissa noted, a protobomb, a translation capability between the two major flavors and standards of uh, SBOM. And we've been very fortunate in that that protobomb, that uh, that S software SDK, translation SDK, has now been accepted by the Open SSF, Open Software Security Foundation, which is which is part of the Linux Foundation, has a globally available open source module that is available not just for the companies uh, from our portfolio that worked on it, but for the uh, global software security um, you know, companies as well that allows for easy translation across. Uh, software for uh, S1 formats. Melissa, as we go forward here, how do you envision this scaling? What what, what does it look like? Uh, what what place does it take in the security ecosystem going forward? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I you know I think this is just the first step to advancing the efforts to ensuring software developers and suppliers are incorporating S bomb into what they're. Um, providing to uh, end customers. Um, so as part of that first step, you know, I think energizing the use of it, the broader adoption of it, um, I think also sort of this, um, you know, acknowledgement and recognition that we need to ensure uh, open source security is a priority. Uh, and so I think, you know, we're going to look for more ways to um, to partner with uh, industry uh, in, in how to do that uh, more and more. Um, and so hopefully this this is just a catalyst to to improving our overall software supply chain, um, transparency and visibility. And uh, hopefully others take note of that um, across the, the government as well as um, broader ecosystem as well. Are we envisioning a, a particular size organization that this would be most suited for? Not really, because I think, you know, all of the capabilities that are going to be, uh, that, that are on the roadmap to be built and refined, are going to become available as product SKUs in the market that can be consumed by any, uh, you know, company of any size that uh, that has the ability to, um, you know, buy a product and use it to basically assess that software uh, security needs. So we're not looking at any particular size of companies. It should be usable by any size company. I see. How do people uh, get involved with this? If someone's interested and wants to to find out more, what's the best way to do that? I think one way that we would recommend would be to, we are actually having a demo week. Uh, SVIP has our annual demo week when we bring together all of the companies in our portfolio, including obviously the companies that have been, um, you know, working on this. So on, you know, May 22nd, uh, uh, there will be an opportunity for anybody in the DC metro area to come join us uh, for free and get a demo of those products and talk to the companies directly. And obviously, we are happy to basically ensure that as these companies have products uh, that 
actually become broadly available and they successfully graduate from SVIP as well, uh, we are happy to share that information as well. And if there are, you know, other uh, obviously government agencies and other partners who have an interest in this uh, type of technology and what we're doing, uh, they should feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to chat with them on how best to partner and work together to move this ecosystem forward. Melissa, this strikes me as being uh, another good example of the importance of these kinds of public-private partnerships. You know, we have DHS, as you say, we have CISA, and we have these organizations that you're partnering with to make these products available to to see this through. Could you speak to that element of this? I mean, is this, it seems to me like this really is the shape of things to come. Oh, yeah. Um, we, I love working the public-private partnership model. Um, you know, I think that that it goes a long ways to providing this collaborative model for for bringing about good solutions, um, both from the private sector and the, and the public sector to working together. For sure, um, more to come um, in, in these ways. You know, the Silicon Valley Innovation Program in particular, you know, our um, mantra is to basically energize and mobilize the startup community from the emerging tech space to working on hard problems within the government, in particular DHS. And we're finding a lot of great energy from um, from the tech sector, wanting to um, support the mission in many ways. And in, in the case of cybersecurity and software supply chain security, it's, it's, uh, it's crucial to everybody. And uh, it is definitely an area um, of, uh, of further growth um, that we're looking to partner in, in more and more. And as Anil mentioned, um, best way is to be on the lookout for opportunities, for, for ways that we're putting out um, calls and solicitations. Uh, we, we certainly hope to, um, to encourage more participation from startups in our, our, our efforts going forward. Ben, what do you think? It's really great to talk to people who are actually involved in this fight. I mean, I think we talk about it uh, very theoretically on this show. So right. a great get for you guys. Um, they're doing great work in, in that office. And uh, obviously, I'm pro improving the resiliency of anything. So. <laughs> it was, you know, it was a bit of an eye-opener for me, too, because I think for most of us, when we think about DHS, I don't know. I mean, I guess mostly what I think about is getting through the airport. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's that a big department, thing. though. I right. mean, yeah, they do they do a lot of things, and I think resilience is a word in the industry and in emergency management and homeland security that applies to a whole bunch of different threats. Uh, and you have to have not a threat specific office; you have to have an all hazards office, right, uh, to figure out what uh, systems and and whatever needs to be resilient to protect us against bad outcomes. So I think it fits very well within that office. Yeah. Well, again, our thanks to Melissa O oh and Anil John from DHS's Science and Technology Directorate for joining us. We do appreciate them taking the time. And now a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the leader in operationalizing cybercrime analytics. Traditional threat intelligence is a thing of the past. Cyber criminals are stealing vast amounts of credentials, session cookies, and financial data every day, and it's hard to keep up. SpyCloud is the trusted partner businesses turn to to fully understand their darknet exposure risk and neutralize threats before it's too late. SpyCloud alerts your organization as soon as an employee or customer's data appears on the dark net, so you can act faster than bad actors to prevent cyber attacks like ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. With insights from the industry's largest repository of recaptured data, protect the digital identities and systems most important to your business. Get your free corporate darknet exposure report at spycloud.com slash cyberwire and see what information criminals have in their hands today. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And that's Caveat brought to you by N2K Cyberwire. 
We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. Your feedback ensures we deliver the insights that keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. If you like our show, please share a rating and review in your podcast app. Please also fill out the survey in the show notes or send an email to caveat at n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K CyberWire is part of the daily routine of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K makes it easy for companies to optimize your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your teams while making your teams smarter. Learn how at n2k.com. This episode is produced by Liz Stokes. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. The show is mixed by Trey Hester. Our executive editor is Brandon Karpf. Peter Kilpie is our publisher. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. Hi, everybody. It's Maria Varmazas here, your host over at T-Minus Space Daily, and sometimes a guest on Hacking Humans, too. We here at N2K CyberWire work hard to bring you concise, intelligence-driven news and commentary, and we'd like to know how we're doing. Please take a few minutes to complete our audience survey and share your feedback to help us continue to grow and meet your needs. Visit cyberwire.com slash survey. That's cyberwire.com slash survey to get started. Thanks so much for your input as we reach for the stars. It means the universe to us. Thank you.